welcome to Cinemaholics, where we review the biggest and best films coming to streaming and theaters. We have a special bonus episode for you all this week. Normally, we would do something like a movie this big, a Titanic film of this scale, we would do on the main show. However, Godzilla vs. Kong, which is the movie we're here to discuss today, has released a little bit earlier in the week, March 31st, because it is a holiday week. That's right. Happy Easter, all of you Cinemaholics. So in yeah, celebration Easter. of Easter, what was that? I said happy Easter as well. Happy Easter to you, Alashton, my my co-host from Cinema Blend. Oh, well, thank you. Happy Easter, John. And I'm, of course, John Negroni. And we're here to talk about the latest monster movie in Legendary's Monsterverse, which began in 2014 with Godzilla. It continued in 2017 with Kong Skull Island, which was a very early episode for Cinemaholics. It was like our third or fourth episode of doing the show. You Was it really? Yeah. I remember doing an episode. I mean, I remember... We released the episode. I have no idea what I said in that episode or anything (laughs) like that. But yeah, uh, I do remember us covering it. I was actually talking about it last night with former co-host Maverick Hines. We were chatting and because I remember it, it was the first time he had ever come on. He didn't watch the movie, though. He didn't he didn't watch Kong Skull Island. He watched Samurai Jack season five. So he came on the show and talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Old times. Yeah. After Kong Skull Island, we did get Godzilla King of the Monsters in 2019, which, Will, you missed that conversation because I I don't even remember why, but uh, that was between me and Sam Noland because we saw it together in San Francisco. And so I I actually kind of forget what your thoughts are on King of the Monsters. We'll get in all. Well, we'll, we could talk about the filmography before we talk about the actual movie. And I'll start with this. There is one thing I think all of these movies in the MonsterVerse have in common. They're big monsters. Besides that. Well, something very unique to them as well. I've only seen any of these movies once. I've never rewatched any of them because aside from Kong Skull Island, I don't really like these movies very much. I, I don't think they're very good. And I've had very disappointing experiences with basically all of them. Even Kong Skull Island, which I thought was kind of fun. I also thought was really forgettable. And I had I never felt like I got to go back to that You found it forgettable? Movie. Wow. Hmm. A lot of it huh. was forgettable. Yeah, I've... Uh, I mean, that one I didn't find forgettable. I did find King of the Monsters pretty forgettable. Um, and I thought Godzilla, it held up my memory more than I anticipated. The only stuff that doesn't really hold up in my memory are the human stuff, which I guess is to be expected. Because the human stuff are just kind of, yeah, which is a, definitely the thorn in these movie sides and that, like, they obviously care way more about the monsters than the humans, but they can't spend you know, two hours on these monsters because they're huge special effects and each one costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. Yeah, it's like the price of a small country just to show Kong right. scratching his butt, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. So they have to put put in these human characters. They usually put, like, prestige actors and Like, they don't, like, they don't put, like, you know, like, random schlubs. Like, they just put, they put, like, people up for Oscars and stuff like that in these movies. And even then, they're kind of an interesting, like, lip this test as far as, like, who can really hold their own as actors with these movies because they get yeah. sometimes some of the worst dialogue you can you can imagine. They have to sell it with, like, serious gravitas. Uh, and some of them don't fare for the better, unfortunately. And that's kind of been the tradition in a lot of the Godzilla and Kong movies. They tend to have kind of cheesy human stuff going on. But at the same time, like, there is there is a long, long storied conversation we could have about the legacy of Godzilla, its political beginnings, uh, especially with King Kong, and how these characters, these kaiju characters, have gone from being t- like cultural touchstones and commentary on these world shaping events, like the bombing of Hiroshima and the the Black Experience in America, and they've just become cartoons. You know, they've just sort of become for for like popcorn features essentially and I, I have complicated feelings about that to be totally honest with you yeah i mean i feel i have more complicated feelings about that with um godzilla because like you said it's such a political allegory that the fact they just become kind of like fluffy popcorn movies that 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 doesn't really sit well with me but at the same time if someone were to throw on like a cheesy godzilla movie i'd watch it in a heartbeat yeah they're fun they're always fun that's why i'm conflicted because yeah. i still enjoy them so much but i'm like i feel guilty that i enjoy them but we're, we don't get these like deeper more cerebral godzilla movies we do get some kong ones you know like the 2005 peter jackson one is certainly trying sure. to be like operatic and it's trying to say some things i guess although it's been a while since i well i mean shin godzilla does balance it really well like it has a lot of like deep uh, political right. commentary about bureaucracy and stuff like that while also being a fun godzilla movie so that was definitely one of the better ones in terms of balancing those two worlds but yeah those are few and far between for sure 
and that's that's an important thing to point out. Godzilla is it came out of Japan and has a very specific connection to that country and the the people from there. And America has kind of taken the Godzilla canon and just done something with it that I find just very boring, just conceptually. It's just, this is a, how does humanity, it's just like a Roland Emmerich disaster movie, but given some prestige aesthetic. Once, quite literally in the nineties. That's why I say that. Roland Emmerich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that like they're still trying to do what they try to do in 1998 where they're trying to make like the prototypical American disaster movie and make a spectacle out of these monsters scaring Americans of like imagine a monster coming to America and just messing everything up and it you know that kind of angle which I think is just kind of on its own not very interesting and now they're trying to do the same thing but to what you said they're adding a prestige aesthetic they're getting all of these actors to kind of come in and like add all this gravitas to it you know the the thing i didn't like about the first godzilla was like they only go halfway with that too like you have ken watanabe of course but brian cranston is only there for like a minute and then we spend most uh, he's of the in a, with a decent bit he's, he's in for at least like an hour and was it in an hour? It, again, I've yeah. only seen it once. I remember him being maybe like 20 minutes and we spend most of the movie with his son, who's primarily boring to me. Yeah, Aaron Taron Johnson, unfortunately, is not very good. I do like him as an actor, but in the 2014 movie, he's definitely the weak link because he's just a void of charisma in that movie. Like, I think he is trying and I think his performance isn't necessarily bad. He just doesn't he doesn't have that charisma that Brian Cranston does because he actually gives a genuinely good performance in that movie. It's not like him phoning in or anything like he he is committed to it as much as he would be committed to anything at that time. That was like the Breaking Bad wave. So uh, he is definitely the better of the two actors there. But um, yeah, he's in it for at least least like at least to like i, I want to say like the 70 minute mark but then when it comes to kong skull island they sort of move away from that right because at that point it's been like a few years sort of and they go full tilt in a sort of like what if we did this like a comic book movie right and they even have like comic book you know actors like they i mean at the time right. Brie larson hadn't been captain marvel yet but they had tom hiddleston you know samuel yeah. jackson john goodman tony cabell like they had people in there who were just bringing something to it that was a bit more fun a bit more of like the humans can be like action heroes too which was kind of cool i thought it was kind of like if you were to watch apocalypse now on acid like it just gets really (laughs) weird and like nihilistic oddly in a very kind of like lethal sort of way and i don't know i I have kind of mixed feelings about how the humans are portrayed in that movie but um i think that movie is just a beautiful mess of a film like i I forget exactly what i said about it in our 2017 episode but re-watching the movie it's just like it looks gorgeous like the visuals of it really pop larry uh fong i think uh was the cinematographer on that and he like really makes it look nice but yeah the humans are a real big mis- mixed bag in that film unfortunately but they do have some good uh you, you do get some good performances from like uh john c Riley and from um samuel jackson and john goodwin's there too and he's fun um yeah so it's like a mixed bag that one in terms of the humans well if it makes sense to you it's like i remember them being in it and i remember liking the movie while i was watching it but it's not like i remember who they were or what they brought sure. to it or why any of it mattered. It was just, yeah, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it was just a big screen distraction. And for a lot of people, that's all they really want anyway. Right. Cause like Brie Larson was coming off of room. I think when her Oscar win, yeah. when she did that movie and her character basically comes down to, she is a war photographer. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yep, she is a war photographer. Tom, Tom Hiddleston is there slashing bugs. I remember that. <laughs> oh, he's actually kind of charismatic in it, but yeah, they, they do forget about him in the second half. Unfortunately. That kind of reminds me of Godzilla vs. Kong. But before we say that, and then there's Godzilla King of the Monsters. And, you know, I I remember having pretty high expectations about that one because I was like, oh, wow, like they're really going to like show Godzilla more. It's going to like really be a big monster fest. And I don't know, like the trailer really sold a mood, a sort of like larger than life, musically inclined soap opera action movie. Like that, that to me was like, wow, that that's interesting. That means that it could have some really special things to say about this character, really push this monster verse into something more unique. And then seeing the movie, I just remember being utterly bored by it. And I remember not caring about like the King Ghidorah stuff, the human. I'm all I remember about the humans is they were in a submarine or something. And Bradley Whitford is the de facto comic relief. That's, that's about it. And Kyle Chandler and Millie Bobby Brown are in it, I guess, but I don't remember why they were there. I don't remember what they were doing or any right. reasons why pe- anything was happening. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't even remember Bradley Whitford was in it until I started rewatching. I didn't even finish my rewatch. I'll, I'll probably finish it at some point, but I don't know. I, I definitely think it's the weakest of these, but I I do think it picks up when it is just the action stuff. I, that's kind of similar how I feel about Godzilla v Kong, in that like they they definitely don't really know what to do with the humans. They're kind of caught in limbo for like trying to develop some stakes and trying to establish this monster verse in a way that's like leading up to this movie. But at the same time, the humans in it are just not that interesting or that compelling. And then like Vera Farmiga is like doing like a Thanos thing midway through. And that's kind of weird. Totally forgot. And she was in like, it. yeah. Oh, see, I actually remember her pretty well in it. Like I remember her. I remember Millie Bobby Brown in it. And I remember Sally Hawkins only because they just like unceremoniously kill her off in a way that I felt was really weird and kind of cruel. Um, but uh, yeah, those those are the only humans I had remembered until I my rewatch. Like I had totally for, totally forgotten that um, Thomas Middleditch was in it, and Anthony Ramos, and um, the woman from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and like all these people were in it. And I was just like totally forgot. I think one of the reasons we forget too is that th- these movies in general, and you know, we got to talk about Gods of versus Kong, I know, but these movies in general, they just don't seem to like really care about the destruction right it, it's sort of like it's as long as the humans make out make it out alive that's that's the only stakes it's not really about how these titans wreaking havoc are going to just like tilt the world into a total chaotic environment it's just weird like it's weird how it like rests all of its hopes on like this monster's good this monster's bad and it, it's to me it's it's so surface level uh, you know not to be uh... kind of punny yeah, I mean, it, it is a little weird in the, the later films. I think Godzilla 2014 generally pulls that balance off well, primarily because it's really good about, about uh, establishing stakes and having like a like kind of like bird's eye view of everything and kind of gradually building it up in a uh, very like Spielbergian way, intentionally so, that I find very effective. And, I, and I, there's a real simplicity to how it builds things up. But also very calculated and clearly a lot. It's very apparent to me that Gareth Edwards knows monsters and he can do monster buildups really well. He just is a little bit dramatically inert when it comes to uh, establishing human dynamics and stuff like that. And and it is weird to me that they chose like Aaron Taylor Johnson to be our like audience surrogate character because, like you said, he's like so vanilla and just kind of so haphazardly thrown into the narrative that there isn't really enough for us to care that much about him or his emotional plight other than he has a wife and he, he has which, a son. He has less <laughs> chemistry with Elizabeth Olsen as his wife than he did when she is a sibling. I will say it. I know that's a hot take. Oh, I, I guess. forgot that he was Quicksilver. See, I, I guess that, that speaks... <laughs> So I have, I guess that means I have more affection for um, Godzilla over Age of Ultron, which I do. But yeah, he is. I guess that is true. They were both in those movies. That is kind of odd. I think like the last movie, yeah, and they came out around the same time, like a year apart. I think the last movie I remember seeing him in, I and mean, I'm sure there's something else, but I guess the most recent role I can think of is Nocturnal Animals, where he gets a fun turn in that, I guess. But I yeah, mean, it's a dark, dark turn. But I can't think of anything else he's been in since. He was in an, that Million Little Pieces movie that only I cared oh, about. Yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> um, which uh, I'll say I did end up seeing it. Um, it's not a great movie, but he is very good in it. Like he is clearly a good actor when he wants to be, uh, or when he gets the time to stretch his talents. But I do agree with you. I think something like Nocturnal Animals is better for him because it's like he's better as like a weird kind of character actor than he is as a leading man. Because mm-hmm. like unless it's something like Kick Ass, where it's like the movie's so like bubbly and cartoonish that can kind of make up for his plainness as a leading man i I just certainly don't think he he has like the leading man chops unfortunately and it's i think with kick-ass too it's part of the story that he's kind of plain and boring but like he's in out of his element and then the side characters in that would really make that movie work i think so yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah uh we'll we'll save the aaron taylor johnson retrospective for a future episode for now let's get into godzilla versus kong the actual movie Uh, so this is directed by adam weingard who did your next and death note interesting choice uh to bring him in here for a big monster movie somebody who's more known for kind of horror and an anime adaptation interestingly enough sure well he also did um the guest which i like a lot i didn't Um, see the at least the first like I will say that 80% of the guest is really good, and then, like, the last 20% is, like, so-so. Um, and he also did the Blair Witch reboot oh, sequel yeah, thing that everyone that. forgot about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, like, a, it was kind of being billed as something else, and then they revealed, oh, no, it's a Blair Witch sequel, and then nobody cared after that. Right. So this movie was supposed to come out in November of last year. Uh, however, the pandemic had it delayed, and I think, H- I think Warner Brothers is probably really happy they delayed this because it is... 
now simultaneously releasing on HBO Max, their streaming service, and it's in theaters, and it is making a ton of money considering the circumstances. It's actually kind of unbelievable how much it's making already. It's already the fourth highest grossing film of the year. I know it's not a high bar to cross, yeah. but the, you know, stuff sure. has been coming out and, and if it, it's made this in just a couple days, right? Yeah. $145 million worldwide. I think it's first day, it's like preview screenings and made almost $10 million. I mean, like it's making the kind of money that's way closer to what Godzilla King of the Monsters was. Like it it would, I think there's no doubt that if it had come out under normal circumstances, it would have completely blown King of the Monsters out of the water. Because I think that film only made like sub 50 million, you know, which is obviously yeah. not terrible but for a movie at this scale with this big of a budget <laughs> these movies cost like hundreds of millions of dollars right well the circumstances we it's hard to divorce it from what's happening now and stuff like that but i do think there is something to be said about how if this had come out during a, no, a normal summer season and it was just like the next 300 million dollar summer blockbuster it might have done not as well just because people would just be you know so caught up with the other blockbusters right. that are coming out that they may not give it the uh, give it full attention but the fact that this is like the only real blockbuster that's out right now at a time when people are starting to get vaccinated so they can go to the movies and stuff like that's that that's a good again. point yeah there's less competition people have been wanting to go back to the theaters they're more willing exactly like we can we can talk about this now so you actually rented out a theater because like for you this was the kind of movie that if you're going to see in a theater you are going to see it in a theater because that is the optimal experience right it's another it's like the next tenant yeah. in that sense Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I will just say that, like, I when I heard it was going to HBO Max, I mean, as much as I love the convenience of that, I'm just like, I just can't. This is not a movie I see for the first time on my TV. Like, I'm sorry, no matter how I feel about the film, this is not something I want to see for the first time on my tiny TV or even at the drive in. I want to see this at a theater. And I, I got a chance to see it at a um, theater that only cost $25 a rent, which is a steal. I, I'm debating whether if I should say what theater it is because I don't know if I, I want the business taken away. I'm a little greedy like that. Wow, but, um, well, <laughs> all of our Pennsylvania listeners just. Uh... <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I'll just say it's in Penn Hills if you're in PA. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, right. it, it's definitely, I mean, um, if you if you want to rent out a theater, it, I had a very good experience. Very nice people there. Um, I would definitely recommend it, and and not only for the price. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to see us in theaters, and I did not regret that decision for a second. I wanted to see it in theaters, but, yeah, because I had to cover it and review it, and there's no press screenings, I had to watch it at, on a screener. So that, that's kind of how things netted out. Um, my review of it's live right now on Cinemaholics. You can check it out So if, if you want a deeper dive of my thoughts. But okay, let's listen to a little bit from the trailer for Godzilla vs. Kong. This is our only chance. We have to take it. We need Kong. The world needs him. To stop what's coming. And this child. She's the only one he'll communicate with. I knew that they had a bond. She had nowhere to go, so... I made a promise to protect her. And I think that in some way, Kong did the same. I, I gotta say it was nice to sort of see this before the general public because my the reaction so far has been critics like it fine and audiences are just all over the place. Some people love this movie. Some people think it's uh, Maverick Hines, former co-host of the show, he called this hot garbage, Could, did not like the movie at all. And I know, Will, you were telling me like people, you know, are like just all over the map with this movie. So yeah. Let's let's talk about what we think. Will Ashton, did, sure. did you like did you like Godzilla versus Kong? Um did I like Godzilla versus Kong? Um I liked the experience of it. Definitely I like going to the theater again. I, I was able to socially distance see it with some friends. That was very good. Um I was nice to catch up, see a movie on the big screen again, see my friends, Godzilla and King Kong, most importantly again. Um very happy to see them on the big screen. Um as for the movie itself, um I don't think it's a very good film. But I didn't have a bad time watching it, if that makes sense. Um, I think similar to the other movies and perhaps even worse, the human elements just don't work in this. And I feel like it's more aggressively bad in this movie because 
it's very apparent that they don't care about the human elements, but they drag the movie down because there's enough monster stuff in this and there's not enough like building up of stakes to lead up to them that it just constantly feels like, oh, great. Now we got to watch, uh, you know, Alexander Skarsgård and and all these other people. And and I do. I really did like um, Rebecca Hall's performance. And I, I don't know the daughter's name, but the Kaylee um, Hoddle. Yeah, Kaylee. Hall, I think all that stuff worked, or at least I was I was definitely found that interesting. The angle they took with her and king kong but um by and large i felt like the human stuff was really dragging this down more so than the other movies where i felt like they were able to balance that stuff okay or at least in a way that i wasn't really bothered by it as much with the exception of king of the monsters um but at the same time i do think that um at a wingard he has a style that i don't think really translates to this film as much as like um, Gareth Edwards style did to Godzilla or that uh, Jordan Vaught Roberts style translated to um, King of, or uh, Skull, Skull Island. Island. Yeah. yeah, but um, I do think that he does bring like a pulpy sensibility to this that, that does have like that B-movie quality at a huge scale that it, it's kind of hard to dismiss. Like when it is the monsters just duking it out and having fun or um, battling it out and we're having fun, um, I, I do think movie generally is really fun and if you can see Godzilla with a giant electrical axe smashing Godzilla in the face and not smile. I, I don't know what to say. You might be comatose. Um, like, that's just, I'm sorry. Like, that's just going to get a big smile out of me. Like, that's it's such a, a wonderful image, especially to see on the big screen. But uh, the other stuff in the movie, I, I feel like I could just really take or leave. So I liked this movie. I thought the human stuff was okay. I, there was nothing about the human stuff where I was like, this is actively bad. Uh, you know, there were some parts where I, th- I think there's like, two groups of characters that I really just didn't care about. I didn't care about Alexander Star- Skarsgård. I didn't care yeah, about didn't. any of the villains. I didn't care about Isaac Gonzalez. I didn't care about Damien Bashir's oh, yeah, character. I just thought that they were all boilerplate, you know, the people yeah. I, and I also didn't care about Millie Bobby Brown and yeah. Julian Dennison. I, not at all, but I did really like Brian Tyree Henry and oh, I disagree, but okay. I loved him. Loved him. Uh, oh, I thought he was. This is a rare bad performance from him. I thought. I yeah, total disagree. I him, Kaylee Hoddle, and Rebecca Hall. I think those are the characters that work here. When they were on screen, I was into it. And fortunately, we don't usually see any of those other characters without them around. So I just found myself, even though I, I found a lot of these characters not very interesting, not very, you know, exciting in any sense. Uh, I liked some of the characters in each scene. So I was like, okay, I I think there's some weirdness, honestly, though, with the Kaylee Hoddle character, this idea that there, there are some weird tropes here. Uh, she's, she's a deaf character. There's this idea of like people like me who have like a disability, have this connection to, you know, also indigenous people having a connection to nature yeah, and like this mystical stuff. That mythic quality of it kind of feels uh, like very tropey, as you were saying. It, it's it's tropey. It, it, for me, it didn't wreck the movie or anything. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a choice. Uh, it's not a choice I personally enjoyed very much, but uh, I think that Kaylee Hoddle really sells it. I think she's such, I think she brings like a presence to this character that kind of rises above those shortcomings in my opinion and rebecca hall i think is just really well cast here i think we definitely agree on her but yeah i think i think the reason i'm okay with this movie a bit more is because they know that we're here because of the monsters and i think unlike those other movies we spend a lot of time with like the monsters around godzilla's not in this a ton but kong is and i think like yeah he's a character he's he's an actual character he has a character arc he he there's a connection between he and him and the humans that's like there's an emotional connection the stakes are like rebecca hall's character and uh kelly hoddle's character like they care about him they like they they genuinely want him to be okay, and they look out for each other. And so, like this movie gets it. Like that's where the monsters sort of uh, that that's where like you can have a movie where like you're kind of like similar to the King Kong movies. Like the connection between human and monster is what kind of carries it through. Whereas like Godzilla is this like far off deity sort of character. For me, that works because that's how I view Godzilla. Like you can't really do that with him. He's just sort of right. this like you know very amoral godlike character that will either destroy the world or help save it and i I know i think this movie understands how like what would bring these two characters to fight in a way that is visually and visually interesting and thrilling and i think that's what we get yeah i mean godzilla or yeah sorry um kong king kong was made by god and godzilla was made by man so inherently they are at odds um 
at least that's how I like to look at it, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with you that um, King Kong here, it definitely, I think it helped a lot to make him an actual character, like you were saying. Like, he has an arc. He, he has a fully sort of, I mean, it's not like this, that his arc is that deep. He just wants to go home, and that's basically it. And he has a connection to this young girl because he can speak sign language with her. And it's not like it's, like, anything profound or anything, but it does help a lot. Like, it does make... Uh, their scenes a little bit more interesting. I, I think he is the reason why this movie ultimately works because I generally think with the other um, MonsterVerse movies, they usually have one actor that like even when the cast kind of like teeter totters from like good to bad that kind of keeps it in line. And like with the Godzilla, it's Ken Watanabe. With um, uh, uh, Kong Skull Island, it's like John C. Riley, and uh, to a lesser extent, like Samuel Jackson and uh, John Goodman, and then even in the um, uh, King of the Monsters, uh, Ken Watanabe is able to do that if to a lesser extent if, as well because they don't give him as much to do. But with this movie, there isn't really that like dramatic pull. I think they try to do that with Rebecca Hall, and I think she does a good job, but she's just not really in the movie enough to like be at the center of the film so king kong thankfully is and i think the movie like you said the filmmakers are smart enough to f- keep the focus on the monsters and keep them the uh dramatic center of the film in a way that uh it's silly to talk about i guess but it is a- a- what the movie is and and i think they pull that off pretty well yeah they set him up he's the protagonist of the monster characters he's the underdog so like when the actual fight happens it's not just what it's been in the other movies where it's just two monsters duking it out you know, like two monsters that kind of have a similar sort of like detachment from everything with Kong, you know, I actually understand like what will happen if he loses and you know how that affects this, that could actually like will affect the planet, you know? Yeah. Uh, There's a, there's a lot of other stuff in this movie. We didn't really describe the plot because I I think that it's kind of secondary in a movie like this, but I mean the main, it's it's basically Atlantis. They're trying to get to the center of the earth. They, it's like a, you know, science funded mission, you know, what's going to happen, you know, who the bad guys are, you know, they're going to run into problems, you know, there's going to be other monster characters that get in the way, there's going to be fights. I mean, it's, it's all pretty standard. There's there's no point in this movie where I was like, whoa, what did not see that coming? Like I knew what was going to happen to these characters three scenes before, (laughs) you know, it's that kind of movie, but I still had fun. Yeah, I mean, they introduce, I mean, I won't give it away because it's kind of a surprise, I think, but they do introduce a like third monster character that I was anticipating that is from the like Godzilla lore it's not like like I said it's pretty easy to guess if you know but I, I wasn't really anticipating it because I wasn't reading up on this film a lot right I didn't I didn't even see the trailer for this movie so I had right. no idea and I, I honestly I don't know the, this movie super well I had a suspicion because of like the apex thing and like yeah sure you're right and they they sort of hint at it but for me it, it, it was a while into the film before I kind of figured that out myself right I mean what I meant was like Going into the movie, I didn't know that was going to be a component. Like, they, they established throughout the movie that that's what it's leading up to. But, like, before the movie started, I didn't know that that was going to be an element of the movie. So, as I was watching, I was just like, oh, okay. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah, because it's like, I didn't, I didn't know we were going to go in this direction going in. So, this is a this is a fun detour. Even though it kind of, it does create kind of a cop-out at the end in a way that you can expect. It kind of becomes Jurassic World a little bit, right? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that is a weird thing that um this movie and um Kong Skull Island has that they have like some very like Jurassic World type qualities. Uh, they do, unfortunately. Yeah, but um yeah, at the same time, yeah, I mean I do agree with you. I think the movie is smart enough because it does feel like the movie is condensed. I don't know if you felt that way throughout. I did. They cut a lot out. Yeah, I was gonna say because like I heard initially that this movie was three hours. And then they were like, no, 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 it's two hours. And I have to assume that there was actually a three-hour cut of this. And Warner Bros. is like, under no circumstances are you putting out a three-hour Godzilla versus Kong movie. You cut that down however you can. Obviously, they're not going to cut out the like Godzilla or yeah. King Kong scene. So they have to like kind of figure <laughs> out among the human stuff what they're going to cut. Because like Lance Riddick is in this for like honestly, I think like two minutes. Yeah, they were clearly mm-hmm. they were yeah. gonna do way more with him. Jessica Henwick was in this, and they just completely removed her. Oh, she's gone. Yeah, yeah Zhang, not, Zhang Zi Yi from King of the Monsters. You mentioned her. She she yeah. was supposed to be in this, and yeah, nope. Um, I don't. I think I don't know if Fear from Mega was supposed to be in it because they kept showing pictures of her, and I was like, okay, they're probably gonna introduce her at some point. Not nope, that I know of. I don't know if she was supposed to be in there. I honestly don't even remember if she died or not in the last movie. So, I thought she. Uh, I thought she sacrificed she? herself or something, but I, I, she, I can't like remember. Like I said, man. I, I, well, because right. she's like evil or whatever. But then she like, how I don't know, like saves yeah. everybody. I, I could be totally misremembering. 
Yeah, but there's also like other like there's like little cheats throughout the movie where you can kind of tell like there's like maybe like a scene or two that they lost like yeah like when they they introduce like Alexander Sarsgaard he has like long hair and a beard the next time you see him he just actually doesn't have a beard or long hair anymore like it's just instantaneous well, okay, it's okay. Like, he cleaned up a little bit I buy that's there's way more yeah. weird stuff in here than that I'm just that's just the the, the one example that came to mind there's other stuff that I could point out but they're spoilery so I didn't want to mention it well it, a non spoiler one I'll say is like they they build up this whole like they don't do like the build up to this is our crew this is like the scientist or whatever you can right. tell that like there was more to that there was other like i think that's where some of these other characters were supposed to come in but they just like condense that down and you can tell that it was supposed to be more of a journey in hollow earth because like, you could tell that it was supposed to be three hours because like we don't even get to the, the hollow earth stuff until pretty far into the movie to the point where i was like okay this third monster are they just saving is that going to be the the tag at the end of the movie i think up until like the last half hour i was thinking okay that's going to be a cliffhanger but they don't they just sort of give the last part of the movie just to that and i was i was kind of surprised honestly because i was looking at the runtime and i was like how are they going to fit this in with credits and they kind of do right. yeah uh like i said kind of miraculously because like i said they they cut as much as they could in a way that i'm kind of surprised the movie is actually decently coherent like, it feels like I was able to follow the story decently well. Like you said, it's not like the Same plot here. was that in, in depth. So, like, it's not like a, like, Justice League situation where, like, they, like, butchered it out of, like, coherence. But at the same time, yeah, it does feel like they made a lot of cuts. Anyway, uh, I think that my long-winded point was just to say that, like, I, I, I don't think this movie, um, as a film, I don't I don't think it fully comes together in a way that, like, is completely narratively satisfying. And like you said, the story relies on a lot of tropes and cliches. But at the end of the day, I, I do appreciate that the filmmakers are smart enough to know what people are coming in for. And, and generally speaking, I think by the end, I was more satisfied than not. Like I had a decent time watching it. But would I say it's a good film? Not necessarily. In my review, I kind of likened a lot of the energy of the human stuff to kind of how Transformers, the first one, sort of handled human characters it's very manic it, like that brian tyree henry character genuinely feels like he should be in a michael bay movie and oh absolutely yeah <laughs> honestly i mean he's basically like uh anthony anderson's character in the the first three yeah Transformers kind movies, right? of a little yeah. bit yeah uh, i think it worked for me though just because i was like if will ashen was in a godzilla movie as like a podcaster you know conspiracy theorist co podcaster i think i'm just kidding <laughs> oh i have yeah, I mean, I have a lot of questions about his podcasting style. Like, he records it <laughs> yeah. in his car, but the, the audio quality is, like, immaculate. Like, how what's, what's his secret there? I want to know that. <laughs> yeah. Add that to the, to the three-hour cut, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he has, like, a whole setup we can't even understand. Yeah, it's it's a dumb movie, for sure. It's dumb. It, but I still get a lot of kick out of it. And I don't I don't fully understand why people hate it. Like, I can understand being, like, like you are, like, dissatisfied with a lot of elements of it. But you get what you get what's advertised. So like if you've seen the trailer and you know that, OK, you're getting the, the main point is Godzilla fighting Kong. And I think they do that stuff really well. So I guess like I don't know. I feel like I wish we could have somebody on who really hates this movie. I know some people are annoyed with it being kind of uh, superficial in, with its plotting, yeah. I guess. But I don't know. I, I, I don't hate this movie at all. I think it's very, very satisfying for what it's trying to do primarily. Is this where we introduce Maverick Hines back into the show? <laughs> I I, um, I honestly didn't even want to ask him like why he disliked uh, it because he just he was he was upset and I just didn't want him to dwell on that you know I mean, I'll 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 talk to him more about it but uh, sure. okay <laughs> what's your letter grade? Um, I'm gonna give it two letter grades. It's a bit of a cheat, but I'll explain why. Whoa. Um, I think if you're I don't know about I this. think if you um I think if you watch this at home or on HBO Max, it's a C plus. Like I think that's the quality of the movie. Uh, just in terms of, like what you're getting out of it, like I said, I think the human stuff really does drag this down. It does like it takes like an hour for this to really get cooking, and I, I just felt that even more so than the other monster movies, I felt like the human stuff was like really in the way. And uh, like I said, just I don't think the movie itself really comes together in a way it's super coherent or anything like that. But um, I want to say like a year or two ago, it was like pre-pandemic. I got a chance um, at the theater where I work. We we put together a little like. Um, uh, 35 millimeter show of two Godzilla movies and I got a chance to watch most of those and those are two films it was like older like it was like Destroy All Monsters and I forget what the second one was um, and it's like those movies in that like 
the those movies aren't really good films. Like they're the the acting is very hokey. Like the the scripting is very like cut and paste together and stuff like that. But I had a great time watching it because it was on the big screen. It was with the full audience. Like everyone was having fun. It was just like this is what I like from a monster movie. Like it's just fun. Like people are having a good time. And and I have a special memory in my heart for those movies, even though it wasn't a very good film. And I think that's going to be what my experience is like with Godzilla v Kong. In that like I got to see in the theaters. I got what I wanted out of it. I got to see it with friends. I got to reunite with Godzilla and King Kong. It's not a good film. I don't think it comes together well, but for that experience alone, I'll give it a gentleman's C or a B minus. C, like even lower. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like this movie though, so I'm, I'm definitely the more positive. I'm, I'm a B. I think it's really, I, I generally think it's really solid. I, I didn't hype it up too much, but I, I do think that the actual fight, the multiple fights between the actual monsters, are more memorable, more interesting. There's more to them. I, I cared about Kong in this and I feared Godzilla more than I've ever feared him as a character because he's just, he's devastating. And it was just so remarkable to start to feel the impact of his power because it was hurt. It, I never cared about the humans in these movies, but I cared about Kong. So like when I see Godzilla wailing on Kong, like I felt something, I don't know. I, I think that that this movie kind of nails how to do that dynamic. It's obviously not great in <laughs> plenty of other departments, but I think the fact that this is under two hours and the fact that they it is efficient with its storytelling to the point where it understands what you're here for, I, I really appreciate that this movie prioritizes what you came to see. And I think that's ultimately why, for me, this is this easily my favorite of these monsterverse movies i'm a very specific though type of fan of these films i'm not a fan really but I, I, in terms of kaiju movies i have a specific like taste for them that is, i think is different from a lot of people and so i i'm not surprised or disappointed that other people come to these movies with a different set of expectations and for that reason i don't think that all those expectations will be met right so i i definitely find that kind of a bummer i wish there was like a uniting godzilla kaiju movie that everybody could be on board with i guess shin godzilla was that i feel like everybody's pretty much in yeah it's a good film one, right watch it yeah yeah watch shin godzilla it's a good film yeah J japan is just i think just better at these kinds of movies generally you know I, I i think at least compared to america i just i just think we don't get what how to do this or strike that balance uh i mean i, I disagree in that like i generally think Godzilla 2014 is a good film. It definitely has its faults. Uh, we could go on about those, but I think, generally speaking, Gareth Edwards knows what he's doing with Godzilla, and I, I think the special effects are really good in that movie as well. Yeah. And I think it's really good about uh, establishing the stakes and building up uh, the tension in a way that uh, makes the, the last act really satisfying. Also, it's a pretty funny film. That's definitely, I think, the funniest of these four films, uh, Godzilla 2014, because that's like a kind of dry, dark sense of humor. That's better mm -hmm. than like the wacky stuff they're doing with Bradley Whitford and wherever they're trying to do with Brian Tyree Henry in this. So, um, yeah, I, I, I got to disagree with you there. I, I will I will take your opinion and I will revisit the film and, and you know, give you the benefit of the doubt there. Because, you know what, it has been a long time since I saw it. Maybe I'll rewatch it and I'll, I'll see what you're saying and I'll be able to, we'll have a follow-up conversation about it. Oh, boy. I, I'll be very curious to hear what you think. I, I Like I said, I mean, it has its faults, but I generally think it's a good film. All right, very cool. Well, if you check out Godzilla vs. Kong or if you've already seen it, let it, seen it, let us know what you think. Send us an email, cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can connect with us on social media as well. Links are in the show notes. And you can find Will and myself on Twitter, of course. Uh, our Twitter profiles are in the show notes. Hope to see you all soon for more conversations about kaiju movies if they keep this MonsterVerse thing going. Do you think, do you think this is it, though? Are we getting more of these? I don't know, because that's what I was asking my friend after the movie is that I think... After um, King of the Monsters, they, they just wanted to throw this out because they were just like, yeah. oh, we, we uh, don't want to do this anymore. But now this is actually exceeding expectations in a major way and actually gathering a lot of chatter. I don't know. Maybe they'll do something. Well, their contract with Toho is expired. So <laughs> yeah, that's, <what laughs> they, I figured. That, that's the that's the challenge. Yeah, I figured this was supposed to be the last one. But um, this, at the yeah, same time, I that was the, this was the planned sort of like avengers endgame sort of thing so if they do something else it's going to kind of be resetting the book on it so we'll see yeah i guess it really does depend on the box office and if toho and legendary strike a, a deal and decide to do a, another saga or something we'll see yeah i don't think this is the last we've seen of either king kong or godzilla at the very least <laughs> well, they still have some differences to work out 
Yeah, I'm sure therapy. I, I'd love to see. Like, there is like that meme going around with like the marriage story with Godzilla and King Kong. I'd like to see that movie mm. with them just kind of duking it out. Now that God or um, King Kong can talk, we can kind of hear a little bit more of what he has to say. So, how would Godzilla communicate? Well, I guess we'll find out. Uh, uh you know that that's what you have to figure out when you watch the movie. Yeah. Oh wow, it's Godzilla. What's that? Oh man, you gotta get some cop drops in your buddy. You're, this press tour is doing a number on you. Thank you so much for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe to Cinemaholics on your favorite podcast app of choice or find us on YouTube. See you all next time.